Hey, what's up, everybody? Sean here popping in for this week's Flight Crit Live broadcast, and I just wanted to welcome you all to, to, the, uh, to the broadcast. I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to pop in here before uh, I really get ramping uh, this thing up. Um, if you guys are catching this on the replay, you can still leave a comment below and let me know uh, who you are, where you're calling from, or where you're listening in from, and uh, let me know uh, what you think. If you have any comments or questions, you can put them uh, in the comment section below too, and I will uh, answer those uh, when, I, uh, when I see them. Uh, okay. Uh, I hope you guys had a fantastic week. Uh, this is Thursday, and this is the uh, my uh, my weekly broadcast where I'd like to pop in here and say hello to everybody, try to answer some questions from students for the uh, past week, and then try to touch on a topic that uh, I find uh, is useful. Uh, announcement. Uh, there is a critical care conference that is going to be happening in Estes Park, Colorado. If you don't know where that is, it is just outside of Rocky Mountain National Park. And this is going to be happening in February. I believe it's the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th. So it's a four-day conference. Uh, I'm going to be speaking at that conference, uh, and I'm going, to be giving a top, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk about ketamine. Uh, I know we've all heard um, a gazillion lectures on ketamine. So I'm going to try and make this a little bit uh, interesting, try to give you guys some information that you may not otherwise uh, have already heard. Um, and uh, you know, if you have comments or questions that you want to add to the conversation, um, by all means, um, put them in the comment section below. And I will uh, absolutely add those to my lecture if uh, they seem to be appropriate. And um, I will uh, kind of share that out with the group as well here. Um, if you are just popping into the lecture, please, uh, I've seen a couple do, people do this already. Um, go ahead and hit the share button down there. Share this out, see if we can get some more people in the broadcast. And um, leave a comment sec uh, Leave a uh, comment below. Let me know um, who you are. I can see that there are people watching, but I can't exactly see who's watching. Um, and again, uh, if you are not able to finish this, um, this broadcast, uh, I will update this um, to the website over at flightcrit.com, um, and I'll share a link out here to uh, where you can find that over uh, on the website. And then um, don't worry about like trying to follow any of the links that I talk about here when I'm uh, lecturing. Uh, I will include the links to everything that I talk about uh, over in the uh, comment section uh, over um, uh, over at the the website uh, when I repost this all right uh, Steve Schmidt um, see you uh, taking a look at one of the other uh, groups that we have here um, that's pretty cool uh, all right so as usual, I want to kick things off with uh, a couple questions that I've gotten uh, over the last week. Just kind of scroll through um, and see what we've got here. Um, Luca, you asked about difficult airway management. Um, and uh, basically, um, this lecture will actually talk a little bit about difficult airway management um, and how, that, uh, how we can apply that to our, our practice. Um, let's see. Uh, and then, uh, I've done a number of broadcasts, but, um, I think one of the best things that you could do if, if you really are wanting to dive deep into the world of difficult airway management, um, is just, well, one, spend a lot of time in the lab. Um, but two, you know, you've got heaven's criteria, which is a fantastic tool for doing a pre-assessment of a patient to, to decide if they will be a, a difficult airway uh, and then, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with these salad trainers, which we know based on um, the Heavens Criteria study, which was done by uh, um, David Olvera from uh, Air Methods uh, and the gang over at Flightbridge Ed, um, that one of the biggest indicators or biggest causes of a failed airway is uh, airway uh, contamination. So making sure that we're doing a good job decontaminating those airways goes a long way uh, in making sure that we have a successful uh, intubation. Uh, what else? Staying up, uh, staying up to date with ever advancing procedures and practices. This is from Kevin. Uh, I agree. That's always a challenge um, for everybody. 
what else can I see here? EKG changes due to pH level changes in the body. I'm going to hold off on that one. I'll put a comment. I'll put a link um, in the comment section because there, um, there's somebody else that can talk about that uh, a whole lot better. But we do know uh, that uh, acidosis causes um, profound myocardial uh, uh, contractility suppression, right? So um, as a patient becomes more and more acidotic, we start to see pH changes. Uh, or I'm sorry, as they become more, more acidotic, we start to see more incidences of bradycardia, hypotension. And a lot of that is because of that electrolyte imbalance. We know that as a patient becomes uh, acidotic, that a lot of the hydrogen ions gets get sequestered inside the myocardial um, cells in an attempt to bring that pH back to normal. But what ends up happening in exchange for hydrogen ions is we get potassium that runs out of the cell. So we get these hyperkalemic states, right? And we all know what happens when a patient becomes hyperkalemic. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Other questions, gas laws. Uh, there's a blog post over at flightgrid.com talks about the biggest uh, gas laws that you need to know for air medical transport. But really, you know, we've got Boyle's law, uh, we've got Dalton's law, and uh, we've got Charles law. And those are probably the three big ones that we need to be aware of. Um, the biggest one is Boyle's law. And we know how Boyle, Boyle's balloon, as air pressure um, goes down, volume expands. Um, and that can have a significant impact on our patient's um, for a lot of reasons. If they've got uh, air in their head, uh, that can cause increased ICPs. If they have um, uh, pneumomediastinum, they've got air in their chest, that can cause um, cardiac tamponades and tension pneumothorax. That's also uh, what causes the, you know, these tension pneumos to develop in patients who have a small pneumo, you know, and then we take them up to altitude. Now, all of a sudden, they, they rapidly decompress and we're, we're having to code them in the aircraft um, because we, we either failed to recognize or we failed to address um, small amounts of air in the chest. Uh, Jeremy, hey, what's up, buddy? How's it going? Thanks for popping in and leaving me a comment. I see Andy in here. Nice to see you. AJ, thanks for popping in. Uh, apparently, you and Andy know each other. That's cool. Thanks for popping in, guys, and uh, watching the broadcast. Um, okay, a few other things here before we kind of dive into this. Blood gases, um, pre-hospital care, pretty generic. EKG changes, we already talked about that. Oop, I went the wrong way. Uh, online video, let's see, that's in there. Ventilators, ventilator settings and blood gases. Um, if you are still wanting to get more information about pre-hospital ventilator management, uh, I'm going to refer you to my friend, Melissa Versman. She runs the course Beyond the BVM. Uh, she is a respiratory therapist turned paramedic. Um, she's been a pediatric and flight uh, respiratory therapist for many, many years. Um, she and I did a, um, a webinar together, which um, will be up on the website. I'll try and get that up here uh, in the next day or so. Um, it's about an hour long, but she really hits on some really great information about vet management in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, she also, like I said, runs the course Beyond the BVM, which I'll link to uh, in the comment section below uh, here in just a little bit once I pull that up, um, and you can follow her. Um, but uh, a lot of good information there, but that's kind of a broad topic that we really just don't have time to, to delve into. Um, one thing I do want to put out to everybody who's watching right now is conferences for 2019. Uh, if you've recently joined, um, you know that I asked some questions when you when you joined flight, uh, flight, the Flight Crit Group. One of the questions that I'm now asking is conferences. I'm making 2019 my year of learning, and um, and so I'm going to be visiting at least one conference every quarter. Uh, so I'd love to know where you guys are going, which conferences you're going to be attending to. Um, of course, there's the AMTC and EMS uh, World Expo, but I want to know the other conferences that you plan to attend. I know we do have a couple pretty good conferences that are going to be happening here in Colorado uh, in the next few months. One of them is the uh, uh, EPIC, uh, not the EPIC, the uh, Estes Park Critical Care Conference, um, which I mentioned at the beginning. And then there's another one being put on by the uh, Peak to Plains RETAC, which is in, uh, where is that going to be held? Cripple Creek, Colorado. Uh, and that, I believe, is in March. And um, we're going to have some speakers there that you guys will know. So, um, um, oh my goodness, um, Cynthia, I'm drawing her blank. Um, she's part of the Flight Bridge Ed crew. They're going to be, she's going to be there talking um, as well as um, Tyler Christofoli. He's going to be recording a new podcast from 
um, from the conference for the Foam Fret uh, podcast. And then, um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm, 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 yeah, what other conferences? Uh, uh, what other conferences are going to be going on here? Um, sorry, uh, I just wanted to. There was one other one that I really wanted to, um, uh, really wanted to touch on because it sounded um, sounds like a great one. Um, Cynthia, Cynthia Griffith, uh, she's the one um, that's going to be there in uh, in March, and. Um, and then Eric Bauer, he's also going to be there talking ventilator management. So uh, if you're going to be out in uh, Colorado, you can swing by that conference and I'll post a link below. Check those guys out, say hello, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good time. Uh, I'm going to try and visit and uh, just kind of say hi to those guys. Uh, okay, so in this lecture, we're going to be talking about ketamine. And I know that we've all been ketamined out in the last, you know, five years, it seems like. Um, and I'm going to try and talk about some things that we may or may not, uh, that may or may not be talked about uh, enough. Um, and this is kind of in preparation for my, for my lecture at the uh, SS Park Conference in, uh, in February, where I'm going to be giving a two-hour talk on, on ketamine. So um, I want to know what your feedback is and uh, what your experience is. So ketamine, right? This is kind of like that one drug that everybody's talking about, been talking about it for quite some time. And uh, I think most flight programs have adopted its use. And I think a lot of ground services have adopted uh, its use, uh, even though um, technically it's only very recently been um, acknowledged as a safe and effective drug for um, the treatment of pain. Uh, and I should probably kind of clarify this. Um, it's only recently been accepted as a, a safe and effective um, treatment for pain in the emergency room. And I will share, um, let me go ahead and share out my screen here because that'll give you uh, an idea of what I'm talking about here. So, um, Let's see if I can do this. I should be able to do this. I don't know why I wouldn't be able to. Um, sorry, guys. But uh, the American College of Emergency Physicians, back on October 2017, uh, originally approved um, ketamine for analgesics in the emergency room. And, and then it was uh, accepted or approved in December 2017 by the Society of Emergency Medicine Physician Assistants and then approved by uh, the Emergency Nurses Association in January 2018. And this is sub-disassociative doses of ketamine, um, also known as low-dose ketamine or analgesic um, dose ketamine. And this is that 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilo dose. Um, so part of my talk is going to uh, talk about the different dosing regimens for ketamine. And, um, and how they change the way we can manage our patients. And then some of the risk factors that we need to be aware of when we are dosing patients in these, uh, these different ranges. Okay? And there are some things that we, uh, we should be aware of. Um, so let me come back over here. Um, so let's start by talking about um, the dosing. Okay, and, and this is kind of just me brainstorming here ideas. I've already kind of put them down um, and kind of pulled some of the, the stuff that I think is, is most important, most uh, essential for us to know. Subdisassociative dose of ketamine. So this is that 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilo, right? Uh, this is, that, play, uh, this is that, that dosing range where they don't become all loopy. They don't have an, um, amnesia. Uh, they don't kind of have that disassociative state where their brain disconnects from reality. It just has a very strong uh, analgesic effect. And this can be a very valuable um, uh, treatment for pain, especially in the day and age uh, we are in right now where we have these um, massive problems with uh, opioid addiction and things of that nature where, uh, you know, not only are our patients addicted to opioids and having uh, potential problems with uh, trying to recover from their addiction, but um, also we have 
significant shortages of lots of opiates. So if you can speak with your physician and, and find out uh, about getting this approved, then I think that we, you'll find that this is a great uh, adjunct therapy for a lot of our patients. Now, then we have, um, so that's the sub-disassociated dose, so 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilo. Then we have um, the disassociative dose, okay? And disassociative dose is that one, um, one milligram per kilo to two milligrams per kilo, okay? Um, and um, this is the point in which um, the brain disconnects from the body, right? We still get this analgesic effect, but the patient has no awareness, right? Their ability to take in um, stimuli from the outside environment is severed from, from the brain's ability to actually interpret that, uh, that information, okay? And so that's where that disassociation comes into play. Those stimuli are still coming into the body, the brain just physically can't make the connection between the, the receptors uh, or the stimulus and, and the brain. And the reason for this is ketamine works on what's known as the NMDA receptor uh, in the brain. And the NMDA receptor um, is a glutamate receptor and it also requires uh, another component in order to actually uh, fire and trigger. Um, but what that glutamate receptor, that NM NMDA receptor is responsible for is it's the primary um, receptor responsible for memory. Okay. So uh, it takes in the, the, the stimuli, it sends that to the cortical region of the brain and the brain then processes that and turns it into a memory. Well, when uh, ketamine goes in and it binds to those NMDA receptors, it blocks that trigger. It blocks the, the receptor that's responsible for memory formation. Okay, so um, that's why the, this drug is so effective at um, disassociating our patients and basically putting them into this state where they do not care about what we're doing to them or to what, what's happening to them. Um, they, they are not able to perceive the uh, the uh, external stimuli. Okay. Now we know that um, you can also give ketamine in the two to three milligrams IM. Even some protocols will say up to five milligrams IM um, in order to achieve that same response very quickly without having to have IV access. That's um, uh, we see that more often when we're dealing with um, like those. Um, uh, da, 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 the excited delirium cases, okay, um, where we need to be able to control a patient um, safely without having to gain IV access. All right, so um, onset of duration, we know that higher doses, uh, the onset of um, uh, action for this medication is between 45 and 60 seconds. Some will say 30 to 45 seconds. So it's essential, especially when we're doing these RSI uh, cases, that we are giving these patients the full 60 seconds after we give them the ketamine and the induction agent uh, to allow the full effect of that medication um, to, to take, or for, that, for the full dose of that medication to take effect, right? So um, there are Initially, there was a lot of concern about, oh, we give ketamine to these patients, but um, it takes so long to, to take effect. And in the lower doses, that can be, that can be true. In the uh, IM doses, that can be true. But in these high-dose IV um, uh, doses, dosing regimens, uh, the onset's actually very quick, uh, just about as quick as anything else you might give, like Atomidate or Versed. Um, the duration, though, is what's beautiful, okay? The duration of ketamine is anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes, okay? All of this is stuff that you probably already, already know, but it's just good uh, to cover again. Um, okay, let's see here. Pop in real quick to see if there's any questions. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, seems 50 50 and give him is he RSI? Is he, uh, Aaron, what do you say here? Uh, you fly in Texas, we use ketamine for RSI and moderate sedation, as well as lotus for pain management. It seems like 50 50 when giving ketamine for RSI, 
uh, I get an increase in blood pressure. And then the other 50%, it drops the pressure. And we're having to push dose pressure to avoid code. Uh, for moderate sedation, I see half my patients get a really bad trip and become agitated, while the other half get the desired uh, sedative while maintaining spontaneous ventilation. In my practice, I'm having, I am having a difficult time predicting what ketamine's response will be with my patients. Any suggestions? Great questions. Okay, let me talk about um, kind of what you, let me kind of break this down. Okay, so um, you're giving low dose for pain management, and, and then it seems like 50% of the time, you're getting an increase in blood pressure and 50% of the time you're getting a drop in blood pressure. Okay. Here's what I want to say about um, blood pressure in ketamine. Ketamine has a sympathetic um, uh, effect, right? It causes a release of catecholamines. Um, and so in all patients, there should be a bump in sympathetic stimulation. Um, or I'm sorry, there should be a bump in catecholamines, right? However, Sorry about that. My heater was blasting me out. However, I want you to keep this in mind. Okay. A patient who is, um, uh, in extremis, right. The, you know, whether or not they are hypotensive from, um, you know, from, uh, blood loss or, you know, pain or whatever it might be, whatever the reason is that you, is causing you to have to go ahead and, uh, RSI your patients and, and intubate them. A couple things are going to happen. Even though ketamine is going to give them a little bit of a catecholamine bump, when you take away that pain, when you sedate them, suddenly their body is no longer responding to the external stimuli. And so they don't have the fight or flight mechanisms that are really cranking that, uh, you know, that are there prior to you taking away their pain and their sedation. Okay. So it is normal to get a, I would expect that you would get a drop in blood pressure um, uh, if the patient is not adequately resuscitated prior uh, when you give ketamine. And so I don't know which kind of patient you're referring to, but right, we still need to be thinking about our, our uh, resuscitate before you intubate kind of uh, scenario. If it's a trauma patient, we need to expect that they probably have blood loss. Um, and then we also need to anticipate that um, they're going to have a decrease in sympathetic tone when we take away their pain and when we actually disassociate them from whatever that external stimuli is. That is to be expected. So having your push pressers <clears throat> ready, uh, having adequately fluid resuscitated those patients ahead of time is essential. Um, now, um, let's see, I had a thought. So uh, fluid resuscitation, have your pressers ready, um, pain. Yeah. So that could be part of what's going on with your patients. Why, why you've noticed uh, a drop in blood pressure. Now, the fact that you're getting a decrease in blood pressure all the way to the point that you are potentially having to, um, uh, code them. Um, that is, um, I personally have not seen that happen, um, as a result of ketamine, uh, it would not be outside of what I what I might expect to see if a patient's been under flu uh, under resuscitated prior to the to giving uh, the ketamine just because of what I mentioned. Um, feeling on push dose vaso and neo built into preparation for an RSI patient. Uh, we do not do pe uh, push vaso um, just because it is um, such a profound presser. Um, I have heard, uh, of course, a lot of places use push. Um, um, uh, Neo and push Epi. Uh, I think it really just depends on what you want to do. If you have a patient who's uh, hypotensive, uh, Epi is great. I think if you have a patient who's strictly um, uh, vasodilated, then um, um, the Neo is better. Um, but Vaso, I have personally not heard. If somebody else has has heard of push Vaso, uh, by all means share it, and uh, we'll we'll look into that a little bit more. Um, that seems to be an answer to some of those patients that don't have the catecholamine stores available a way to catch them before we get into the induction point. Totally agree. Um, yeah, if you have that patient who is uh, catecholamine depleted uh, for one reason or another, uh, they're already bradycardic, they're already hypotensive, the last thing you want to do is tr take away any kind of sympathetic stimulation that they may already have um, um, with any kind of induction agent, whether that be uh, ketamine or tomidate or you know, uh, 
uh, fennel versed or anything before you've adequately resuscitated them. And uh, you, know, you might even need to think about starting them on um, a, a pressure, uh, a vasopressor infusion prior to going ahead with the uh, induction agent if you really think that they're, they're that soft. Um, okay, so what else was I talking about? Um, talking about the loss of sympathetic tone, NMDA receptors, important for forming memories. Um, talk about duration, uh, the duration of the medication. Oh, um, so I do want to talk about some kind of novel ideas or novel uses for ketamine um, that we're starting to see some uh, show up in some of the studies and some of the uh, um, some of the other foam, foam med, um, podcasts out there on blogs. But before I get into that, um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, side effects and then also um, the pharmacodynamics of ketamine and its uh, induction um, curve. Okay. Um, give me one second here. I want to, I want to be able to share this post with you. And uh here we go okay share all right one minute where is it so if you haven't heard of this you should look it up People talk about um, like dosing ketamine, and there's like a lot of a lot of um, anxiety sometimes over how to properly dose uh, ketamine. And, and originally, there was even some discussion about like overdosing ketamine. And um, I want to dispel some of those concerns for you. Okay. So what you should see here is a, uh, a website. This is uh, emupdate, emupdates.com. And, um, you know, you'll, if you look down here at some of the authors, um, you'll probably recognize, uh, if you, you scroll around on this page, you'll recognize some of the authors. But um, this one here, so, so the ketamine brain continuum, okay? And what you'll, what you'll, um, what you'll learn when you read through this is basically that, like I mentioned, ketamine binds to these NMDA receptors and prevents them from forming memories and prevents them from taking in external stimuli. Okay. And what this, um, what this blog post talks about is this, uh, how we dose our patients and the effect that it can have on them. So we have this analgesic dose, which we already talked about. And then there's this recreational dose is 0.2 to 0.5 milligrams per kilo. And, you know, whatever, you know, whether or not, you know, that's, that's true or not, you know, it's beyond, that's beyond me. But what I want you to pay attention to is this partially disassociated dose. Okay, we know that when we actually uh, want to disassociate somebody, we will give them one milligram to two milligrams per kilo, or one to one point five milligrams per kilo. Okay, this partially disassociated dose range, this 0.3 or 0.4. Uh, in this case, it says 0.4 to 0.8. Um, I have also seen it um, 0.5 to one. This is that point in which the patient um, is partially disassociated, meaning some, some of those NMDA receptors are blocked and not forming many, many uh, are not forming memories, but all other, uh, uh, other NMDA receptors are not blocked, okay? And so if you read here, it says many will be unable to see or hear, talk or move, um, um, but these capabilities, they will fade in and out. Okay, so what ends up happening is you have this patient who is kind of disassociated, but they have these intermittent periods where those NMDA receptors are firing and they're able to form memories. Um, and then, uh, but, but the full understanding that the full sensory input is not making its, in, making its way into the brain. Okay, so what happens is, is 
the patient starts forming these weird memories. The patient has these, these sensory inputs, but the brain can't fully make sense of it. Okay. And so that's where you get these patients with this, um, with these emergence uh, syndromes, right? So these periods where um, they have these, um, these freak out moments. Okay. Um, and so the way you avoid that is one, you give them a heavy disassociative dose for induction or you give them a small analgesic dose for pain management. You totally avoid that potential risky range of even call it 0.3 or 0.4 all the way up to, up to 0.8 or 0.9. Here's the problem I have with, um, with going with just a 0.1 milligram per kilo induction uh, dose. Most of the time when we are um, dosing our patients, we don't have an actual uh, uh, body weight, right? We're guessing. We're looking at them and we're saying, I think that this patient weighs about this much and um, I, uh, I'm going to dose them based on what I anticipate. Well, we're really bad at, at guessing how much somebody uh, weighs, right? We really are. So um, what you're more likely to have happen is underestimate the patient's weight. So if you underestimate the patient's weight and yet you still dose them at a, at a dose that you um, think is their actual body weight, right? Then, you know, you're more likely to be coming in shy of what a true disassociative dose would be. So myself, I am about 75 kilos. Okay, but if you look at me and you underestimated you know, how much I weigh and you dose me at, say, 68 kilos, right, then you're going to be coming in about seven or eight kilo, uh, milligrams less than what you should. So that can very easily move me from one milligram per kilo down to true 0 0.8 to 0.9 milligram per kilo dose range. And now you're running the risk of putting me into that partially disassociated um, range. Okay, and so that can be very dangerous. So if you're going to RSI somebody, here's my recommendation. You should be dosing them higher. If your guidelines say 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilo, go with 1.5. If they say 1 to 2, go with 2. And this kind of goes back to what I was just talking about, um, that brain continuum, okay? Ketamine, once it blocks those NMDA receptors, they're blocked, it doesn't have any additional effect on the patient's um, um, consciousness or their, uh, their apnea or um, you know, hypotension or anything like that. Once those NMDA receptors are blocked, they are blocked. So that's why if you come back over here, uh, I share this back out again. Um, where is that? I want, I want you to look at that again. Um, where is it? Let's share this back out. I want you to see this because I really want this. I want I want this point to sink in. Um, is if you look here at the the way they've drawn this this picture here, it's a good representation of what happens. The patient is you know here's the analgesic state, then they kind of go through this partially disassociated disassociated state, and they're disassociated, and then the the drugs effect on the body plateaus. Right? So the more drug you give them, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have any more disassociation. They're not going to have any more effect. Right? So going with two milligrams per kilo or going with three milligrams per kilo IV, um, you're not going to put that patient into uh, any more uh, deeply sedated state. What I will say is there are a few side effects that do occur in some of these in patients with, uh, who receive higher doses. Um, most of them are transient, so things like um, brief periods of apnea, typically less than 30 seconds. Um, not a problem. They almost always will start to spontaneously breathe on their own again. Um, increased uh, hypersalivation does occur with higher doses of ketamine, so be aware of that. You might need to suction a little bit more. Um, you might need to try a little bit of atropine if that's in your guidelines, especially if they're bradycardic, to try and try to dry up some of those secretions. But mostly it's just about being aware that those uh, side effects can occur. Um, we know that ketamine is a fantastic drug um, for intubating the asthmatic patient or anybody with bronchodilate, uh, 
uh, bronchoconstriction because it has a very potent bronchodilation effect. Um, we already talked about sympathetic bump and uh, you know, originally there was a whole lot of concern over the use of ketamine in patients with elevated ICPs um, or any patient who would, who was at risk for um, uh, head trauma or, or elevated ICPs. And what the studies have really shown, and I, I'll put uh, a link to this in the comment section is that um, in almost all patients, there is an increase in blood pressure and um, with that, an increase in um, cerebral blood flow and cerebral perfusion pressures in um, almost all patients, there is a, uh, there is either a, um, well, in, in almost all patients, there is no change in their ICP. And even in some patients, there is a decrease in ice in intracranial pressure. So if you think about that, you either have consistent ICP uh, or a decreased ICP with increased cerebral blood flow and cerebral perfusion, right? So uh, cerebral perfusion, cerebral blood flow means better tissue brain perfusion and better outcomes, or at least um, adequate uh, or, or a not, not impaired um, cerebral um, blood perfusion or, or brain tissue perfusion. Okay, so my point to that is don't be concerned about um, giving a patient with an elevated ICP or head trauma ketamine because you're worried that you're going to spike their, IC, uh, their ICPs and cause them um, further uh, complications down the road. That's, that's kind of the big point there. Um, let's see here. A point about uh, emergence syndrome. Okay? There is a reason why it is called emergence syndrome. And we talked about these patients having um, uh, the the on, or the duration of ketamine being between ten and twenty minutes. It's when these patients start to come up from their disassociated state that they have this emergence syndrome. They are emerging from their uh, their ketamine induced disassociated state. Why do you think that is? What did we just talk about, about that partially disassociated state? That's that point where the brain can still take in some stimuli, but it can't fully make sense of it. And that's what happened is as that ketamine is metabolized and it's secreted from the body, the, the, free, the free drug in the system that can still act on those NMDA receptors starts to de decrease. And what happens is, you start to get a period where some of those NMDA receptors are blocked and others are not. So it's the same effect as a patient who has gotten a sub disassociative or um, uh, yeah, sub disassociative dose of ketamine um, for induction. They still are getting some uh, stimuli, but their brain can't make sense of it. So the way you manage this, if you are, managing a patient who you're going to need to have sedated for greater than 20 minutes, put them on a ketamine drip. Ketamine drip is fantastic. I don't know too many places that do it. I used to do it where I flew pre um, previous to where I'm working now. And it was fantastic. You didn't have to do the fentanyl and Versed. You didn't have to run your propofol drip so high um, that you were jumping the patient's blood pressure. You could give them a bolus dose of, of ketamine, do your RSI, and then start them on a ketamine infusion at 0.5 mics per kilo per minute or mics per kilo per hour. And, um, and these patients would do really, really well. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, so consider that as an option. Um, you're going to keep that therapeutic range, that therapeutic dose um, going. And then as the patient, as you get to the hospital or as they decide that they want to start waking the patient up, an, an, a great little trick that you can do in order to avoid or prevent some of that, um, that emergence phenomenon is give them a little squirt of benzos. It's going to work on a different part of the brain. It's going to induce some of them, that amnesia, and it kind of bridges that gap between um, the disassociated and the partially disassociated or the, the non-dissociated um, dose range of ketamine. Okay, so a little bit of benzos, give 0 0.5 to you know, 1 milligram of Versed, works really well. Just kind of takes a, a little bit of the, um, the edge off. 
Um, let's see here. Kids. Kids, you don't need to really worry about um, uh, those uh, disassociative or the emergence. I'm sorry, not the, not the dissociative, but the emergence phenomenon. Why? Because they, I guess, I don't really know if uh, there's any good evidence to suggest why kids don't. Um, but anecdotally, it seems to be that because kids don't have the same experiences that adults have um, to draw on, Yes, they have creative uh, memories, our creative um, imaginations, but the memories of trauma uh, is not there so much so that when the brain is trying to make sense of this uh, discombobulated sensory input, um, they don't, the kids don't have anything in their past, right, in their deep-rooted memory to draw on so that the brain can then formulate these terrifying um, experiences, these terrifying memories. So don't be so concerned about kids with um, emergence phenomenon. Uh, what else do I want to say about this? I've got a ton of other stuff. Um, for my lecture, but I don't want to, I don't want to drag this out too long. I do want to have an opportunity to take some, take some questions. Um, the last few things that I want to um, kind of put out there for people to think about is, um, I wish I could pull the picture up. I'll put it in the, in the, um, in the show notes that I'm going to put on the website, but think about ketamine for those patients who are, um, have massive facial trauma that you are concerned about uh, are assigning them, taking their airway away, laying them back. Now they have a, an airway full of blood. Maybe you can't keep them properly decontaminated. This came up after a really bad call that I had years ago where uh, it was a uh, self-inflicted gunshot wound to the face. Um, the individual uh, survived, was alert and appropriate. Um, and when I got to him, uh, basically everything from his nose down was gone. Rather than try to... Uh, suction this guy's airway, lay him back, RSI him, and, and chase bubbles with the tube, we elected to pack his face and um, suction him and run for the closest ER uh, in an attempt to get anesthesia there with all of their, um, all of their tricks and tools and everything like that. And ultimately, the patient did not have a good outcome. Now, in the um, post-incident uh, assessment, one of the things that came up was the idea of using ketamine to do an awake upright uh, crike. Okay. Now in New Mexico, they say you cannot intubate somebody without full um, uh, sedation and paralysis. Uh, if you're going to go, if you're going to do a drug, a drug assisted or drug aided uh, intubation, it has to be full tilt. You have to do uh, pre-induction and uh, RSI. However, what I did not know at the time um, and that I discovered after the fact is that they do not consider a surgical airway um, to be an intubation. And so what we could have done was given the patient a disassociated, disassociative dose of ketamine, left the patient sitting upright, done an awake surgical crike with the patient breathing, and then pass the tube in, then given him um, paralytics if we needed to or continued the sedation. Airway would have been secured. We could have then packed his face uh, even better and done everything we could um, for hemorrhage control uh, of, his, of his face, and he probably would have had a much better outcome. I share that because that was one of those things that didn't even cross my mind. It came up after the fact, and I want people to at least think about um, other uses of ketamine other than just straight uh, induction for RSI. It's not anything that's going to be uh, necessarily in your guidelines. It was not in our guidelines. I know that uh, here in Colorado where I practice, they're um, pretty limited on paramedics use of ketamine outside of uh, RSI and, um, and um, uh, blah, 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 excited delirium. Um, but it's one of those things that you, you know, look at your system, look at, see what they will allow, talk to your medical director, uh, and maybe, you know, go to your state and try to push for these more uh, aggressive um, guidelines that will help you better take care of your patients. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Uh, I guess the only other thing is that I, I want to share here is there is some um, research um, that's been conducted on the use of ketamine for um, super refractory uh, epilept uh, epilepsies or seizures. Now, to understand what they're talking about, you have to define it. So uh, 
a refractory seizure is any seizure that has not responded to first line and second line medications. So benzos are your first line, second lines are things like your barbiturates, your um, um, Keppra, uh, Propofol, things like that. Beyond that, um, when you start getting into some of the more uh, heavy uh, anti-epileptic medications, um, that's when you start talking about those super refractory or those refractory, I'm sorry, those refractory seizures. A super refractory uh, seizure is a seizure that has persisted for greater than 24 hours. Now, I got to tell you, you know, what I've read is that any kind of seizure activity that lasts greater than 30 minutes, that's when you start getting into uh, brain tissue. So if you've got a patient who's been seizing consist, excuse me, consistently for 24 hours, they're going to have some serious, um, you know, uh, hypoxic or, or metabolic brain injury. But at that point, what, um, what some of the studies have looked at is using ketamine to break these super refractory seizures and they're finding really good effect. So I don't know if that's something that we may start to see come out as a potential, uh, first or second line medication, um, you know, now that this research is being conducted, I'm going to do some more uh, investigating myself, but I wanted to put that out there um, to, to see if anybody has any experience with that, um, has looked at that, is, is using that in their guidelines to see uh, if anybody uh, has studied it uh, or what, is, what others are finding on the topic of ketamine for um, super refractory status, as, uh, status epilepticus. Um, uh, Ketamine and asthma. I know it's a bronchodilator and preserves ventilation, so you can give it for an asthma attack uh, and defer intubation. Um, ketamine for uh, intubating asthmatics is your induction agent of choice. Um, there are a number of uh, reports of ketamine being given as the induction agent of choice for a status um, uh, asthma attack. And then the provider choosing not to go forward with the intubation because it reversed the patient's um, uh, uh, bronco uh, bronchoconstriction um, so profoundly. I would say if you have made the decision that you're going to go forward with intubation, your default should be to continue with the intubation. Um, and then continue those other NEBs, get your steroids on board, because we know that with things like albuterol and with epi, and, and I don't know exactly what the, uh, the duration is um, for ketamine for asthma, but I suspect it would still be very similar, 10 to 20 minutes. Um, if you have not interrupted the pro-inflammatory process that is causing the vaso, uh, vasoconstriction and the um, uh, inflammation, then it seems to me that the patient would, uh, their inflammation, their airway constriction would return, right? So if they've gotten to the point where they need to be intubated for acidosis or whatever it might be, it, you might want to continue with the, the, um, with the RSI, place the tubes, sedate them, continue them on an on a infusion of ketamine perhaps, and then continue with the, the uh, inhaled um, bronchodilators and make sure you get those steroids on board as well. But that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, um, and that would be one to maybe talk about with the intensivist or the ER doc if you're doing it uh, in the ER. But if you're on the field, I think it'd be best uh, just to go ahead with the, with the intubation. You can always continue the sedation, and they can wean it as soon as the patient gets to the hospital if, uh, if the gas is and everything looks okay. Um, the last thing you'd want to do is put yourself in a suboptimal place to then uh, have to re-intubate the patient um, and then risk uh, you know, risk uh, a problem, um, you know, from, from the actual procedure of intubating them again. So, uh, I guess that's all uh, I have to say about that for now. Let me go through the questions here. Uh, Aaron, you're very welcome. Thank you for the, thank you for the, uh, for the question. Um, that was a really good one. Um, the key to giving ketamine for pain is give it as a plus 10 minute infusion. If you give it as a push, you're basically doing a coin toss, whether they're going to get some disassociation with it, uh, which is not what you're going for if you just want to treat pain. Adam, uh, I would agree. Um, and I think that that's really what it comes down to is your dosing. Okay. Because um, if the, it, it depends on their pain, uh, right, and how well you can control it. I mean, we push fentanyl and we push, you know, Versed. 
uh, we push morphine, all that. Um, if you've got anything to kind of um, further elaborate on uh, the disassociative effects of ketamine via push, um, specifically because of the rate of uh, pushing it, uh, share that with me. Let me know. Um, you can email me, Sean, at flightcrit.com, or you can message me here. I don't think, and I've never read anything that says that pushing ketamine uh, faster versus slower has an effect necessarily on um, the disassociative effect. Um, that being said, right, medicine's medicine. We, we learn to dance in the gray area, right? Nothing's ever black and white. Um, since the, since the sub disassociative analgesic range is between 0.1 and 0.3, um, and the partially disassociated range seems to be a little bit higher. I personally would not have uh, a concern with even going you know, up to 0.3, um, IV push for pain. Uh, assuming that I'm confident or that I know for sure what the patient's weight is. If I can't figure out their weight at all, I'm probably more likely going to go on the lower end, okay? Because if I overestimate, then they're even lower, and then I can always give them more. I can always give them another, you know, 0.05 or 0.1 mg per kg um, to, you know, kind of titrate up that, that pain management. Um, and if I am, if I am uh, overestimating their, their weight and I go with 0.3, then I'm more likely to push them into that partially disassociated state, which I definitely don't want. So uh, if I really know where the patient is, um, I won't hesitate how much they weigh. I won't hesitate to go 0.1, or, I'm sorry, 0.3 uh, for pain management. Um, maybe push it a little slower, but um, if I'm, I'm not comfortable at all with what their weight is, then I'm probably going to go smaller and I can always redose them, um, you know, three to five minutes later, kind of give them some time to have that kick in. But Good point about that. Um, I think it's always good for us to be thinking about, you know, the way we're managing these patients and not just simply um, throwing drugs at them. Um, Carly says, uh, I'm not a fan of ketamine for pain without using an adjunct like Ativan. Um, okay. Yeah, whatever. I mean, and to be all in honest, to be all honest, um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the only thing about adding in the benzos is now you risk uh, uh, respiratory suppression. Um, I've had really, personally, I've had really good luck with just giving pet, uh, ketamine for, for pain um, and not had any problems with airway. Um, but if, you're, if that's what you're com comfortable with and that's what your guidelines go for, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problem with that. Um, but in that case, uh, just make sure that you're doing a very thorough assessment. Uh, you make sure you're watching their, their uh, respiratory status very, very closely. Um, of course, anybody that you're giving any medication to like, you know, like a benzo or analgesics or even ketamine, uh, you should have them on um, capnography um, so that you can monitor that because there are those patients that will have um, unexpected untoward effects, uh, side effects uh, of prolonged apnea. It does happen. Um, and so you just want to be able to monitor that, uh, especially with those asthmatics. You can see whether or not um, they're getting relief from the ketamine alone or whether or not you need to start adding in more bronchodilators. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can actually pull this up and see more comments here. Uh, let's see here. Just scrolling through the comments. Um, uh, giving Ativan and or Benadryl before pain dose ketamine helps prevent the bad trip. We use those mixes in the ER all the time. Great. That, I, you know, that's the first time I've heard of Benadryl, but I mean, that seems to make a lot of sense, right? What about uh, if they've got some, um, uh, some nausea? What about Finnegan, right? Who knows? Um, but I think that's cool. Um, throw in a little Benadryl and give them some prevention there. Um, the experience that I've had with uh, preventing bad trips, like you, like you mentioned, is um, dosing them when they're on their way back up. Uh, of course, Ativan, Ativan being uh, a more long-term, longer-acting medication, so it could still cover them 
uh, as they start to reemerge if you're just needing to uh, induce them for RSI. Um, um, or like a procedure, uh, doing like a procedural sedation on them, um, then yeah, I can see how the Ativan would kind of cover them um, as the ketamine starts to wear off. Um, Benadryl, same thing. I take half-dose Benadryl and I'm zonked for three days. So I don't know what it is about about that, but that's, a, that's pretty cool. I like the Benadryl idea because, you know, Benadryl is a dime a dozen. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Keep giving Kevin, you know, we talked about that. Uh, Kevin, you ask me, we talked about that. Cool. Well, hey guys, I don't have anything else. I mean, next week I'll, I'll have more on the topic of ketamine um, that I want to share with everybody. Sorry, this was kind of a ramble. I just, uh, you know, kind of have my, have my, my notepad that I use as I start to brainstorm ideas and I kind of jotted down some things that I wanted to talk about. Um, other things that I'll probably talk about um, next week as I start to further develop this idea um, is go more into the pharmacodynamics of ketamine and elaborate a little bit more on this sedation continuum. Um, uh, talk a little bit more about the drips. Um, I do want to kind of talk a little bit more about um, ICPs with ketamine. Um, I am dosing, of course, as always. Uh, an important thing to consider. Um, there is some, um, uh, there's actually quite a bit of uh, research out there on the use of ketamine for uh, depression. Now, that's not really going to be something to be concerned with or that we're going to be using in, in our setting. Um, but, but being aware of, of the, you know, the whole range of, of uses of this medication can be very uh, beneficial as we are transporting patients um, who may have, you know, maybe they've got ketamine uh, in their uh, in their uh, medical history, um, and you know, you're trying to understand like, you know, why does this person have this drug in their in their brown bag of uh, that they're bringing with them to the hospital? Um, other things that I wanted to talk about here. Let me bring up uh, one PowerPoint that I did. Uh, last year, talking about um, pre-oxygenation. Of course, we've all been um, DSI to death, um, but I think it's also, but I think it's, there's a lot of value in it, um, especially when we start talking about what kind of patients are at risk of these um, um, uh, acidotic uh, arrests, um, patients who are, are chronic um, or they're profoundly acidotic, um, and then we take away their, their airway um, and we induce a state of respiratory acidosis on top of their metabolic acidosis and how quickly these patients can have a, um, a, um, uh, an acidotic arrest and how we can prevent that with DSI and how uh, there's this hemoglobin desaturation curve. Um, you know, we talk about the oxyhemoglobin curve, but there's also this um, hemoglobin desaturation curve and how the sicker our patients are, the the rat, the faster they de, uh, desaturate, and how we can kind of anticipate where they are on that curve, and then respond appropriately. Um, yeah, so these are all kind of things that I'm going to uh, include in the coming weeks as I start to prepare for this lecture. Let me go ahead and pull up the um, the link for the uh, conference that's going to be happening um, in uh, February. So if anybody wants to uh, make it out and join that conference, uh, join us for that conference, um, you can. There's going to be some pretty, uh, pretty cool uh, lectures there over that four-day uh, four period. Um, and let me see if I can pull up some of the, some of the topics. I know there's going to be a pediatric uh, lecture. There's going to be a DKA lecture. There's going to be, um, of course, I'm doing the, the ketamine lecture. Uh, there's going to be some general medical. Um, oh, uh, one that I really am looking forward to is a lecture by a good friend of mine who um, is a cancer survivor. He's a paramedic and cancer survivor and how he was able to um, overcome the 
uh, a lot of the um, uh, personal uh, struggles with managing um, cancer and, and, and fighting cancer. So here's a link to the, uh, to the conference. If you have any other questions that pop up, anything else that you'd like to hear me address next week uh, in the Flight Brick, uh, in the, uh, the Flight Brick Live uh, broadcast, you can leave them in the comment section or you can also uh, email me or just message me through Facebook if that's what you prefer. Um, yeah. I don't have anything else. If you guys are watching this again on the replay, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, share this out to your friends, get more people in here. I sure do appreciate it. Next week, the broadcast will be on Friday. Um, so I uh, will see you then. Bye for now.